So Daredevil Born Again is going to be coming out in March of next year, and it has some pretty big shoes to fill. Not only is Daredevil one of my favorite Marvel characters ever, but the Netflix show set an incredibly high standard for what superhero television could be. With its action and its near-perfect characterization of Matt Murdock, it made so many people fall in love not just with the character and his stories, but also with filmmaking as a whole. For this reboot, some behind-the-scenes issues have worried me, with the show getting a full creative overhaul midway through production, and I haven't really been able to fully click with a lot of Marvel's new live-action shows, but I'm still really looking forward to this new revival. Charlie Cox is such perfect casting for Matt Murdock, and seeing him as the lead again after his smaller roles like in No Way Home, Echo, and She-Hulk, I can't help but get excited. And so here's 10 things that I want from Daredevil Born Again. Starting with a bunch of multiverse cameos from Ben Affleck, because I guess that's just what we do now. I do want an Evanescence needle drop though, I'm not gonna lie. The actual first thing that I want is for the show to have a good title sequence. This sounds like such a small thing because it is, but I'm such a sucker for a good TV show intro. Like genuinely, it can make or break a show for me. And the original Netflix intro was fantastic. It set such a perfect mood and the tone for the rest of the show with the visuals and the iconic theme from John Paisano. Unfortunately, Paisano isn't coming back to compose for Born Again with instead the Newton Brothers scoring the series, but I'm hoping this new show is gonna be able to do something similar with its opening while still having its own identity. I feel like the art of the title sequence is getting sort of forgotten. Part of the experience of TV is getting excited for each episode, and an opening sequence is kind of part of that. And aside from X-Men 97 and that one episode of She-Hulk, most TV shows just throw up the logo over a black screen with some music and call it a day. Or there's whatever the hell this is. I guess I would rather no intro compared to that. And so I don't need Born Again's intro to be exactly like the Netflix one, not by any means, but I'm hoping for the same level of attention to detail and iconography that was a part of what made watching that show so special and memorable. Why do I need to hit a skip intro button if the intro is two seconds long? It takes longer for your shitty streaming service to buffer the timeline than it would you just watch the fucking intro. Seriously though, I love that Paisano theme so much and I love it even more with today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon's wireless earbuds are known for their sound quality that rivals the big audio brands, but at only half the price. The new upgraded everyday earbuds offer everything you love about Raycon and then some. With an ergonomic design, tap functionality, multi-point connectivity, wireless charging, an awareness mode, and active noise cancellation. All for a fraction of the big guys. They're great for going on walks or listening to video essays while I play Fortnite, which 90% of you are doing the same right now. I talk about it every single time I do one of these Raycon sponsors, but I'm telling you, the biggest thing really is active noise cancellation. The ability to really easily and quickly tune out whatever's around you, either when you're trying to focus or when you're overstimulated, it's really a game changer and it's done wonders for my mental health. I'm realizing now that Daredevil is like the one guy who shouldn't be using noise canceling earbuds. But you know, if you're not Daredevil, go for it. Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash troyaboyo to get 15% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video and thanks to my patrons who are able to get all my videos early and ad free for just $1 a month. The next thing I want is a good costume. For as much as I love the Netflix show, the Daredevil suit was something that it always struggled with. The original black suit looked fantastic, but they were never able to really crack the Red Devil look. The coloring was always too dark, the paneling was weird, and the original versions of the mask just didn't fit his head right. I think the best they got was ironically the one that Bullseye wore in season three. Not to mention a lot of those shows seem pretty ashamed of their comic book costumes, with the other Netflix shows like Jessica Jones and Iron Fist poking fun at their original designs. So I'm hoping now that the show has a new home, we can get a better version of that iconic devil suit, especially after She-Hulk managed to do the yellow one pretty great. I'm not normally a fan of the ketchup and mustard, but I really like how it looked there, despite it basically just being a recolor of the existing costume. Based on the set photos, his suit definitely looks better than it did before, with a more vibrant and saturated red, but it is still very MCU, with a lot of paneling and lines that complicate the silhouette. Daredevil's costume is iconic because of its simplicity. He's literally just red. And I think that that simplistic look is why costume designers keep on trying to add armor and lines when it really doesn't need that much. Honestly, like I don't hate how he looked in the Ben Affleck movie. That was obviously, he actually looked kind of sick. I would love it if we got a version of the black and red suit from Shadowlands or the Char Soul and Rob Garney run. It seems like he's going to have a couple of different costume designs throughout the show, so it doesn't feel out of the question. And I'm really hoping he's eventually given the classic logo. Without it, the design just feels really empty to me. I need Daredevil to have a big pair of double Ds on his chest. What can I say? On a similar note, the next thing I want is for this series to show some love to the comics. Daredevil is in a really unique place in the comics world compared to a lot of other characters. Most of the time in comics, you have either smaller unknown characters who rarely ever get their own solo books, but when they do, they can end up amazing. Or you have characters that are so popular that they're the face of the company and constantly have editorial interfering with what's happening. But Daredevil is right on the line. He's popular enough to pretty much always have his own comic running, but he's also not so big that the suits are always breathing down the creator's necks. And this leads to Daredevil having probably the most consistently great runs in comics. Big ticket writers and artists want to work on the character and they're given the creative 
freedom to really do whatever they want, building upon the character and the world and always providing something new and interesting to say. You could pick up any Daredevil book and chances are it's pretty solid. Even some of the most hated Daredevil comics like Shadowland really aren't that terrible when you compare it to other stories. Like I'd rather that over Sin's Past. And it's allowed for some of the best comic runs ever made, like Frank Miller's run from 1979 and Nascenti and John Romita Jr.'s run from 1986, Mark Wade and Paola Rivera's from 2011, and my personal favorite, Chip Zdarsky and Marco Cicchetto's run from 2019. Seriously, I think that Zdarsky run is like one of the best comic runs ever made. Like you need to read it if you haven't read it yet. I've talked about before that the MCU hasn't really felt comic focused in a long time. The movies have never been exclusively for comic fans or anything, of course not. And I don't need to see the stories adapted one to one, but just pay more mind to the source material and take elements and ideas that can push people to start reading them. The original Netflix show took a lot of inspiration from the Innocenti and Frank Miller runs, including Miller and David Mazzuchelli's Born Again storyline for its third season. And so because it was already done, I don't really expect Born Again to pull from Born Again very much, uh, as ironic as that sounds. And I'm instead hoping that the show bases itself on some of the more modern stuff. She-Hulk took some inspiration, at least tonally, from the Mark Wade run, with Matt being a little bit brighter and funnier, which I think worked great for what that show was trying to do. And I want to see some story elements like in Zdarsky's run, where Matt went to jail after accidentally killing somebody. There's such a rich history and so many beloved stories that it would be such a shame for the show to limit itself just to one or two eras of the books. Just so long as they don't replace Kingpin with Robert Denny Jr. and have him go, um, he's daredeviling right behind me, isn't he? I, I guess I'll call that a win. The next thing that I want is that classic daredevil action. The original series is famous for its fight scenes, whether it be the long take hallway fights or just the general fight choreography. The stunt work of the original series is part of what made it so influential. Every hit felt like it mattered. They took inspiration from iconic action movies like Old Boy and The Raid, and every set piece was done with care, not just for the cool fights, but also how it affected the characters and the story. Based on his little cameo and Echo and that fight scene, I thought the action there was pretty solid, and I wouldn't mind for this new show to have a similar tone and style to it. I don't want the show's action to just be a bunch of CGI models flipping around without any weight to them. Just because there's an all one take fight scene done in a computer doesn't make it the same thing as this. Marvel has kind of a tendency to rely on VFX and CGI for a lot of its projects lately, specifically the volume, which is the LED back wall that was created for the Mandalorian to replace traditional green and blue screens. That technology is incredible and it can look fantastic like in the Batman, but it has to be used carefully or else it ends up looking even faker than green screen ever could. It makes sense, it's cheaper and easier to do that stuff in post, namely because VFX workers are horrendously overworked and underpaid, but that attention to detail and care is part of what made the Netflix show so special. And that also includes the lighting. I don't know what happened in the past couple years, but night scenes have gotten so dark lately that I can't see anything. I feel like there's like a daredevil blind joke in there somewhere, but I can't, I, I, I can't figure out what. Compared to the lighting of the original series or even just any show from the 2000s, it feels like nobody knows how to light scenes for nighttime anymore. I shouldn't have to turn off all of the lights in my room and turn up my screen up all the way brightness for me to see anything that's going on when the sun's down. Like just add a hair light or something. Seriously, it's not that hard. But what good is action if Daredevil doesn't have anybody to punch? Which is why the next thing I want is good villains. Bullseye is probably the one I'm most excited for. Wilson Bethel was just fantastic in season three of the Netflix show. They did so much for Bullseye's character and humanizing him. And after that cliffhanger, I'm really excited to see Ben Poindexter fully take on the Bullseye persona. I was hoping that his costume would be his old Daredevil suit, but with the horns filed off. But from the set photos, I still really like how he looks. Then there's the Punisher, who's not a villain at all, but I, I honestly don't know what other section to talk about him. So I'm, so I'm putting him in here. I love John Bernthal as Frank Castle. That scene in season two where he and Matt argue over their methods is some of the best in the entire series. And I'm so glad to see him come back. I hope now that the Punisher logo has been kind of co-opted by some shitty people, that this show has him denounce that kind of thing. Maybe even give him a plot line where he goes after a bunch of racist cops. That'd be sick. Also, what petitions do I have to sign to get this guy and little baby Tom Holland Spider-Man to interact? That's a dynamic that I've been dying to see for years. We know that Muse is going to be a main villain for this season, who's a really cool new villain that I really like. He first appeared in Charles Soule and Rob Garney's run from 2016, and he's a serial killer who creates quote-unquote art from the corpses of his victims. And then there's of course perhaps Daredevil's biggest villain of all, Kingpin. And in Spider-Verse's case, I mean that literally. Vincent D'Onofrio as Wilson Fisk is one of those comic book castings that's just like... Holy shit. And just like Charlie Cox, I've loved seeing him get these smaller roles, building up to him more as the big bad of street level Marvel. I'm not sure what direction they're gonna go with him in this show, but I'm hoping they end up adapting some stuff from Zdarsky's run and have Fisk become the mayor of New York City, leading to the Devil's Reign event with all the rest of the street level heroes. Also, he's gotta get his McRib. That's a non-starter. I like that I'm at the point where I can just have inside jokes and people will mostly get them. One thing I need from the show is for them to not forget about the supporting cast. Foggy Nelson and Karen Page are such instrumental characters for Matt Murdock, not just for the original series, but also across Daredevil comics. 
Max. Originally, both Eldon Henson's Foggy and Deborah Ann Wolf's Karen weren't going to be a part of this new series. The rumors were that either the show was going to take place during the blip or killing them off screen before a massive creative overhaul of the show brought them back into the fold. I'll get back to that overhaul in a bit, but needless to say, I'm really excited to see the two of them coming back. It was a really weird decision to cut them out, especially given how important they were in the original. Their dynamic and their relationship is one of my favorite parts about that Netflix series. In modern superhero media, it's pretty standard for the civilian supporting cast to either get forgotten about or just folded directly into the superhero stuff. And so I loved all the drama and the conflict that came about from these three people and their stories. Speaking of Karen, I honestly don't really want to see her be killed off in the show. I know that her death is iconic to Daredevil lore and motivated a lot of Matt's decisions in the following years, but after the way that season three did that bait and switch with us, tricking the audience into thinking that she would die and then subverting those expectations, I think it would feel weird to turn around and just do it anyways. This version of Karen has grown into such a great character in her own right, and I don't really think it's necessary to fridge her off like that. I also really hope we get to see Elektra again. That character is also absurdly important to Daredevil in that world, and Elodie Young was just fantastic in that role. I know she's like technically dead or whatever, Whatever, but like, no, she's not. No, she's fucking not. It would be really fun to pull from Zdarsky's run and have her take up the Daredevil mantle for a while, at the very least, so we can see that sick character design translated to live action. And speaking of, the next thing I want to see is a focus on Matt's love life. Because I don't know if you know this, but Matt Murdock is a ho. Lee man. He's a very devout Catholic. Also, he's a little fucking slut. Matt Murdock is pretty famous for his love interests. There's, of course, Elektra and Karen, but also Echo, Mia Donovan, Gloriana O'Brien, Typhoid Mary, and even Black Widow. And I'd love to see some of those relationships explored in the show. I mean, except for Black Widow. I, I think the ship has sort of sailed on that one. Matt's relationships each bring out different sides of him. He's someone who loves deeply, but that love is always at odds with his mission as Daredevil. It's the classic superhero dilemma, but for Matt, it's even more personal. And his guilt over the people that he cares about, especially as a Catholic, weighs on him because of that. I really liked how She-Hulk showed that side a little bit more. It would be great to see Jen show up again in the show, but it looks like Tatiana Maslany is a little bit too based for the Disney Corporation, and they're trying to forget she exists. A lot of superhero media as of late has been, for lack of a better term, sexless for the past few years. I mean, Eternals made headlines for it. And I'm not talking in like a, oh, I want to watch hot and steamy scenes kind of way because I don't know how to use the internet. But romantic relationships have taken such a backseat in these stories. Now it feels like every love interest is either a superhero too, or a glorified sidekick who helps with the tech, or is killed off slash has their memory erased. I don't want to go back to the old days where every female character is just a damsel in distress, but these characters' love lives conflicting with the superhero lives are part of what made the original Marvel comics so well loved. I guess you could say that Matt Murdock gives a new meaning to the name pro bono. The next thing that I want to see is some lawyer stuff. The lawyer by day, superhero by night angle is part of what makes Daredevil so special, and some of the best moments in the original series were the ones in that courtroom. Charlie Cox is just electrifying in those scenes, and I hope he gets more moments to shine in that same fashion. I love watching Matt take on clients who need him, and the ways that their cases unravel into more complicated webs of systemic corruption. And also the ways that his morals as a lawyer clash with his morals as a superhero, and how he justifies those contradictions to himself. Maybe there could be some fun stuff where Matt has to defend someone like Kingpin and Court. Maybe Fisk is threatening someone and Matt has no other choice. Something similar happened in Zdarsky's run, and I always love watching Matt forced to defend people he'd otherwise be in conflict with. I know I keep mentioning the Zdarsky run, but it's a, it's really fucking good, okay? The original vision for the show seemed like it was going to be leaning a little bit too far into the law stuff, basically making it suits with suits and having basically no Daredevil before the retooling. But I'm hoping with the new direction that they can still play around in that setting and do some fun stuff with it. Not to mention, it's just such a classic Stan Lee thing. Like that dude heard the phrase justice is blind and he went, hmm, I got an idea. What about a lawyer? but he's blind. One thing that I don't want is for it to be too much like the rest of the MCU. The quote unquote canon of the original Netflix shows has always been kind of up for debate. When they were first created, they were touted as being fully a part of the MCU and the events of the movies would trickle down and affect the characters in the show. Over time, that started being less and less true. And then when Marvel started making their Disney Plus shows, that was basically thrown out the window. Looking back on the shows, it was pretty obvious that they were treated as kind of an ugly stepchild and more MCU adjacent than anything. Like I honestly feel like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is more in line with the MCU than these Netflix shows were. The shows would reference the rest of the Marvel Universe, but only in like the most vague and passing ways. Instead of talking about specific things that happened in the universe, characters would just say the alien invasion or the big green guy, which honestly I kind of prefer to every random person on the street knowing the full ins and outs of the Marvel IP. Like why would a normal person know who the vision is? And then when Endgame rolled around, this movie that was supposed to be a celebration of the entire MCU and none of the defenders even got a passing glance, that kind of solidified that. And then for years, it was kind of assumed that none of the shows were part of the MCU at all, all the way up until 
until No Way Home brought back Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock and in turn opened up the doors for the rest of the Netflix shows to do the same. And so now that the show and Matt Murdock in general is actively being given a spot in the rest of the MCU, I'm hoping that they don't end up going too far with it and still let Daredevil hold up the show in his own merits. I don't need every episode to have another one-off character from another movie or show. If anything, I'd prefer appearances from Jessica Jones or Luke Cage or the rest of the Defenders instead of like Hawkeye or Ant-Man. I mean, I'd kill for Spider-Man to show up, but we all know that's not gonna happen. But the thing that I want most from Daredevil Born Again is for it to be good. Like, yeah, no shit, it's pretty obvious. Really a groundbreaking YouTube video here. But if I'm being honest, for as much as I'm excited for the show and the return of these characters that I love, I can't help but feel a little bit worried. The recent live action Marvel shows, while a lot of them have been good, don't get me wrong, haven't really been my thing, if that makes sense. Falcon and the Winter Soldier was close, Ms. Marvel was close, Loki, She-Hulk, all very good shows that I enjoyed, but none of them ever pushed past the boundaries of being good to great. And don't get me started on Secret Invasion, and I know Moon Knight has a lot of shooters, but I, I'm sorry, I really don't like that show. And ever since X-Men 97, which was fantastic in every way, that sort of raised the bar for what I'm expecting of my superhero TV. A lot of this comes down to how these shows were structured. With the exception of She-Hulk, these aren't really TV shows more than they are long movies that were stretched out over six weeks. The pacing has always been weird with episodes not really having clear individual stories and structures because they were meant to be viewed in one sitting just as a big binge but still released week to week. Which is ironic because the Netflix Daredevil was a lot more serialized but that dropped all at once for some reason. And it's not just a Marvel problem, it's an issue with a lot of other Disney Plus and streaming shows and even modern TV in general. And so when Born Again was announced, it was said that the show was going to have 18 episodes instead of the usual 6 to 8 or 13 from the Netflix series. Which excited me and a lot of other people. It seemed like they we're going to be putting a focus more on the serialized storytelling, much like She-Hulk did before it. But as of now, that number is a little bit confusing, with reports now saying that season one is only going to have nine episodes. This might be because they went from like 18 30-minute episodes to nine hour-long episodes, or maybe they're splitting it into two parts like they did for Loki. But things are kind of up in the air, in part because of the show's creative overhaul. And that's honestly the thing I can't really shake. To think that the show was completely retooled, that production essentially restarted completely. That like is screaming a lot. I, I'm sorry, that's a lot of red flags for me. <laughs> Reports say that the original vision for the show just wasn't working, that it was too much of a shift from the original and Daredevil didn't even show up in costume until the fourth episode. Practically all of the writers were replaced and everything that was filmed up to this point was scrapped for a new direction, which is why characters like Foggy and Karen weren't originally gonna be a part of the show. And this could mean one of two things. The show could either be incredible that all the problems with the original version were figured out early and now with a clearer vision, they can better do the character and the show justice. Or it could be a total disaster with zero middle ground. Or it could end up just okay. I guess that's still on the table. Overall, I'm glad that they did it because I think this new direction sounds a lot better, but starting over production completely kind of worries me. TV shows and movies being put through what is essentially development hell is always kind of a red flag for me. And for a character like Daredevil, who's so important to me and so important to so many people, that's a little bit concerning. I mean, think about it this way. They released Secret Invasion, but had to hit the reset button for Daredevil. I, I don't know, but I feel like that says a lot. But who knows? Like I said, this might turn out great. And based on how people are talking about the trailer that they showed at D23, it sounds like it very well could be great. And I am overall excited and optimistic about the show. I've said for a while that Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, X-Men, and Daredevil are kind of the last few MCU properties that I'm really looking forward to. And so there's kind of a lot riding on this show. I don't need it to just be a carbon copy of the original series. Of course not, not by any means. And I want it to have its own identity and do something different. I never really needed a Daredevil season four because I felt like season three's ending was perfect perfect as it is, barring the cliffhanger, and I didn't really want that spoiled. But with that said, I can't really help myself. I love that fucking show. And so for what's for all intents and purposes going to be that season four, this has a lot to live up to. And I can only hope that Daredevil Born Again is able to recapture some of that magic and showcase how amazing this character truly is. At his core, Daredevil's story has always been about redemption, perseverance, and overcoming the odds. And this show will have to do the same. But what do you want from Daredevil Born Again? Are you excited for it? Or are you a little bit worried with all the production issues? If you like this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon for $1 a month. Special thanks to Alta the Sting, Anz, Anus425, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Carolyn Brenneman, Chicken McDoofus, Dan, Danny Boy, Eden Kenna, Egan McFarlane, Evan Bowers, Fastest Man Dead, Vin Yates, Hannah C, Harper Sires, Howard Bell, If You Know You Know, Iron Ninja, Jake Selig, Kai Dud, Kendra Hallett, Glass Bear Productions, Morpy, Murano 9, Popcorn Eater 123, Raptorus 77, Sherbet, Slapstick, Spectacular Clyde, TDW Fan, Tim Newfeld, Choices by Richard's Lame, Tyler Goodrich, and Josh Kapoor for being spectacular fanboys. Be responsible, and I'll see you around.